Hello. The episode you're about to listen to is part of a multi-part series introducing an overview of Japanese history. This is a repeat of one of the original projects the History of Japan podcast was built on, and is intended to serve as an update and supplement to these original works. After 10 years, my hope is to return to this approach and to do it a little bit better given the skills that I have improved in the intervening years. If you haven't been doing so already, you should listen to these episodes sequentially, starting with episode 501. Without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the History of Japan podcast, episode 522, Reunification, Part 2. I think it's fair to say that after Oda Nobunaga's assassination in June 1582, the balance of power in Japan was on a knife's edge. On the one hand, the sprawling territories controlled by Nobunaga still represented a powerful base for whoever came after him. On the other hand, more than a few clans in similarly powerful positions had imploded in the aftermath of the assassination of their daimyo. Look at what happened to the Hosokawa clan after Hosokawa Masamoto was assassinated by his adopted children. The clan tumbled into a civil war. But as it turned out, this was not what happened with the Oda lands, thanks primarily to one of Nobunaga's generals stepping in swiftly to the void his master's death left, Hashiba Hideyoshi. Now, as we mentioned last week, Hideyoshi's life before about 1570 is more or less an unknown. There is a common telling of his origin story, that his home village of Nakamura was along the delta of the Kiso River in Owari province, within the territories of Oda Nobuhide and then Oda Nobunaga. In these tellings, Hideyoshi's father, Yaemon, was a farmer who moonlighted as a soldier like many men of his day, because the constant warfare meant there was always a demand for conscripts who could be called up when needed, but who had another vocation to keep them occupied in times of peace. Yaemon, who may have had a surname, Kinoshita, but possibly didn't, died in battle in 1543 when young Hideyoshi, when the young Hideyoshi was still a small child. The story is just humble enough to be believable, but it is all a later invention, after his rise to power, many historians and entertainers would write very similar but slightly different versions of this very tale, and it's unclear to what extent the common story of his early life they constructed was based on actual evidence or recollections, or whether it was invented from whole cloth because, hey, you need something. Nor did Hideyoshi himself write much about his origins except much later in life, and by that point he had started to develop what I think it is fair to call delusions of grandeur, to the point where one of his letters to a foreign king described a literal divine conception where the light of the sun impregnated his mother, so I think it's fair for us to discard that particular telling in our consideration. Sometime in the 1550s, Hideyoshi appears to have decided to follow his father's career, or at least what we know of his father's career, and took up a job as a soldier. He did not, however, follow the Oda despite being born within Owari province. Instead, he took up a job as a retainer of Matsushita Yukitsuna, a samurai from neighboring Totomi province loyal to Imagawa Yoshimoto. It's not quite clear why he'd choose this, or why, sometime later, probably around 1558, certainly before 1560, he decided to leave the service of Matsushita and move over to Oda Nobunaga. Maybe he heard tell of Nobunaga's exploits and thought the guy was the right horse to bet on, Maybe Nobunaga just paid better. We don't know. We do know that Hideyoshi was on Nobunaga's side by the time the young daimyo of Awari crushed Imagawa Yoshimoto in 1560, but it is unclear in what capacity. The famous story often told of Hideyoshi is that he started off as Nobunaga's sandal bearer, but once again that may be a later invention designed to give some luster to his meteoric rise. Hideyoshi himself does not appear in any of Nobunaga's correspondence or records until 1570, by which point he was part of the daimyo's inner circle of trusted commanders, who Nobunaga relied on to get the job done. 
When Nobunaga eventually captured Omi province right next to the heart of the Kanto and directly next to Kyoto, it was Hideyoshi he chose to rule it. One imagines because Hideyoshi was the one entrusted with crushing the previous occupant, Azai Nagamasa, Nobunaga's brother-in-law. Hideyoshi had also been the one in charge of executing Nagamasa's sons, who were, thanks to a now-defunct marriage alliance between the Azai and Oda, Nobunaga's nephews. So far as we know, Hideyoshi had no problems with doing this job. Hideyoshi would not remain in Omi province permanently. Nobunaga rotated him to a new fief in Harima province near modern Himeji a few years later. That wasn't unusual, though. Nobunaga did this constantly with his retainers, likely because the rotation kept any one of them from establishing too strong of a base of power in their province, and thus potentially challenging his rule. By 1580, Hideyoshi was among the senior-most Oda commanders, and in 1582, he was in charge of an all-important campaign in western Japan against the Mori clan, the very same one we talked about back in episode 519. And he was smack in the middle of that campaign, laying siege to a major Mori clan fortress in Takamatsu Castle, when a messenger fell into his hands, captured by his advance guard. That messenger was from Akechi Mitsuhide, who had just completed his strike against Oda Nobunaga and was now reaching out to the Mori, asking for an alliance against any Oda loyalists, and promising an end to the war and future cooperation in exchange. Mitsuhide had chosen the timing of his betrayal carefully. Most of Nobunaga's other generals were like Hideyoshi in the midst of summertime campaigns on the fringes of Oda territory, and could not immediately disengage and march back to Kyoto without risking an attack from the rear. Using the opening allowed to him, Mitsuhide had allowed his forces to plunder Nobunaga's new fortress at Izuchi, completed just a few years earlier, and had seized control of Omi province, making overtures to the locals by offering them tax breaks while he did so. The intimidated imperial court of Emperor Ogimachi offered congratulations to Mitsuhide on his victory, and clearly they, like pretty much everyone else, expected Mitsuhide to either try and carve out this area for himself, or maybe take a greater initiative to seize control of the Oda clan altogether. Hideyoshi, however, demonstrated a characteristic that I think would really come to define him, he was quick on his feet with how he chose to respond. He knew that, thanks to the captured Akechi messenger, the Mori defenders of Takamatsu Castle had no idea what had just happened. So he took advantage and swiftly asked for a parlay with the Mori retainer leading the defense of the castle on Kokuji Eke. On Kokuji's defenders were already flailing thanks to a clever stratagem. Hideyoshi had diverted a nearby river using engineers to flood the castle defenses and ruin most of the food stores. So when Hideyoshi offered on Kokuji, frankly, a pretty good truce deal, except Oda control of three Mori provinces in exchange for an end to the hostilities, Ankokuji, thinking this was a harsh but not unreasonable offer, and that there was no chance of taking on a clan unified by Nobunaga's leadership, agreed. Hideyoshi took control of Takamatsu Castle just four days after Nobunaga's death. The very next day, he was on the road back to Kyoto, and within one week, he had assembled an army, assembled mostly from what he could whip up as he raced back to the capital, ready to face Mitsuhide. In the ensuing Battle of Yamazaki, Mitsuhide's forces were routed. Mitsuhide himself fled the scene, only to be captured and killed by peasants in a nearby village, looking to loot his body and turn him in for the reward. Hideyoshi, boasting about how he'd avenged his lord and shown his loyalty to Nobunaga, offered up Akechi Mitsuhide's severed head to the ashes of Honnoji just a few days later. In reality, one imagines Hideyoshi didn't feel too strongly one way or the other about Nobunaga except as an opportunity. Certainly, his former master had not been terribly kind to Hideyoshi, at one point writing a letter to Hideyoshi's wife calling him a bald rat and describing him as ungrateful to her, while also, at least as I read the letter, flirting with her pretty heavily, closing the letter by instructing her to show it to Hideyoshi. To be fair, that kind of treatment was par for the course for Nobunaga. The Jesuit Louis Froy, who served as the order's envoy to Nobunaga's court 
described him as imperious towards the other kings of Japan and as treating them like his servants. Honestly, Mitsuhide would get a lot more sympathy as a historical figure going forward than Nobunaga did. As the decades wore on, he was often portrayed as a decent man who stood up to a tyrannical monster. By the 1700s, playwrights producing historical dramas about the period were giving him speeches like this, quote, Heedless of remonstrances, Nobunaga destroyed shrines and temples, daily piling up atrocity upon atrocity. It was my calling to slay him for the sake of the warrior's way, for the sake of the realm. King Wu of Zhou slew King Zhou of Shang, Hojo Yoshitoki exiled the emperor. Both in our country and in China, the murder of a lord who does not know the way has been the task of great men who thus give relief to the people. Frankly, Nobunaga wasn't really mourned by many at all, which is not shocking given what we know about him. Similarly, Hideyoshi's claim he was avenging his lord rings pretty hollow given how he moved to secure his own power in the aftermath. Nobunaga, you see, had several potential heirs. Most notably, two of his sons, Nobukatsu and Nobutaka, were still alive in position to lead. After Nobunaga's death and Mitsuhide's destruction, the surviving Oda retainers met up at Kiyosu Castle, the original headquarters of Nobunaga before his moves first to Gifu and then his new palace complex at Azuchi, in order to hash out what should happen next. Nobukatsu was the second son, and thus the natural choice to lead in terms of seniority, but his younger brother Nobutaka had been a part of the army that had killed Mitsuhide, and was thus elevated by virtue of his involvement in the battle which had avenged his father's death. Both had also been adopted out into other families, because it had been assumed that neither one would ever lead the Oda. Thus the Kyosu conference was deadlocked. Nobunaga's remaining followers were divided between the two potential candidates, both out of genuine confusion over who was the better choice, and one imagines by questions of who they thought they could get more out of. Hideyoshi broke the stalemate by putting another candidate forward, Nobunaga's grandson Hidenobu, son of his original heir Nobutada who had been killed the same day he was. And it was true Hidenobu was a way to break the deadlock. However, he was also literally two years old and thus pretty easy for the retainers of Nobunaga to control, and one imagines that factored into the decision-making. Hideyoshi was able to convince a critical mass to follow his plan and assuage the others by overseeing a division of Oda lands which kept them all more or less as equals. Hideyoshi, in recognition of his leadership in defeating Akechi Mitsuhide, was rewarded with Mitsuhide's former fiefs in Yamashiro, Tanba, and Kawachi provinces, but the balance of power among Nobunaga's former followers was carefully maintained. For example, Hideyoshi agreed to give up his holding in Omi province in exchange. Four of the leading Oda generals, Hideyoshi as well as Niwa Nagahide, Ikeda Tsuneoki, and Shibata Katsuie, agreed to jointly govern the imperial capital at Kyoto and then everyone present took a blood oath to support Hidenobu as the new overlord of the Oda. But practically speaking, as Mary Elizabeth Berry puts it in her great biography of Hideyoshi, the decision of succession really had just been punted down the line. Nobunaga's generals had agreed on a candidate who, by virtue of being a literal child, was no threat to the status quo, and on a balance of power between them, designed to make sure no one of them could overthrow the others but the issue of the long term, of the future, was not resolved. Barry, whose biography of Hideyoshi is fascinating by the way and I really recommend it to anyone interested in the period, also notes in her writing that even at this early juncture, Hideyoshi clearly had plans in place to take over. In a letter to a mistress, he wrote, quote, When there is time, I shall recover Osaka and station my men there. I shall order them to level the castles of the whole land, to prevent further rebellions and preserve the nation in peace for 50 years. He was already thinking, in other words, of what he would do when he succeeded in overcoming the other Oda generals and assuming control of the clan, and then the whole country. Still, there was a ways to go before that was possible. In particular, Hideyoshi had to overcome challenges from two of Nobunaga's leading generals, both of whom, despite the oaths they had taken at Kyosu, were clearly angling to align themselves with another potential heir to challenge Hideyoshi. 
whom they correctly perceived as using Hidenobu to prop up his own ends. The first of these men was Shibata Katsuie, a long-standing Oda general whose lands were in Echizen on the northern side of Oda territory along the Japan Sea coast. Shibata, a long-standing Oda retainer, had joined Nobunaga in the mid-1550s after the branch of the Oda he served was defeated by Nobunaga himself. Ever since, he had served his new master loyally and came to resent Hideyoshi's growing influence. As a result, before the year was out, he'd begun to align himself to Oda Nobutaka, the second of Nobunaga's surviving sons, who resented being passed over for leadership. Nobutaka, ambitious in the extreme, wed his aunt, Nobunaga's sister, to Shibata to solidify a partnership and legitimate Shibata as the first among Nobunaga's surviving generals. Nobutaka had also been made the guardian of young Hidenobu as a nod to his role in defeating Akechi Mitsuhide, but rather than moving Hidenobu into Nobunaga's old fortress at Izuchi as he'd promised to do at Kiyosu, Nobutaka took the boy to Mino, where he'd inherited lands from his father, including the old fortress of Gifu Castle. And by the way, that marriage to Shibata Katsuie was the second for Nobunaga's sister, known as Oichi. She'd previously been married to Azai Nagamasa as part of the marriage alliance between the Oda and Azai. That marriage, of course, had ended in bloody fashion after the Azai had turned against the Oda, with Hideyoshi leading the campaign against them and killing Oichi's sons at the end of it, though he did spare her daughters. Hideyoshi, for his part, was well aware of the Shibata Nobutaka alliance. By the 10th lunar month of 1582, so just four months after Nobunaga's death, he was writing to two of Nobutaka's retainers, who'd offered to mediate the dispute between Shibata and Hideyoshi, proclaiming that, quote, "...since the agreement made which was sealed in blood at Kiyosu has been violated, there is no need for you to enter into this matter." In other words, Hideyoshi was saying, I am gonna make a fight of this. All along the way, he proclaimed he was a loyalist to the Oda. He was doing this because of the violation of the Kiyosu deal, in defense of Hidenobu's rule, in memory of Lord Nobunaga. Later biographers, like the authors of two famous chronicles of his life, the Taikouki and Tenshouki, would thus portray Hideyoshi as I imagine the man himself would have wanted, a loyal Oda vassal. Of course, what he actually believed is not quite that, given what we know, for example the letter I read a little bit from earlier. Fighting between Shibata Katsuie and his backers and Hideyoshi broke out at the start of the very next year and this arguably was the most decisive moment of Hideyoshi's career. At this point, Hideyoshi was still vulnerable, but one of a group of Oda vassals jockeying for position after Nobunaga's death. But the military campaign that resulted proved decisive in tipping the balance toward Hideyoshi. Early in the fighting, Hideyoshi planned to take the bulk of his forces to Mino, where Oda Nobutaka had set up shop he'd left a small band of retainers in Omi to defend the province from Shibata Katsuie, whose lands bordered on that region. However, he swiftly got word Shibata had crushed the defenders of Omi and decided to turn his armies around to strike back. According to the later chronicle Tenshoki, Hideyoshi's vanguard crossed the 52 kilometers, or 32 miles, separating his armies in Mino from Shibata Katsuie's new camp in Omi, in an implausible five hours, catching Shibata totally unprepared at Shizukatake and routing his entire force. Hideyoshi himself then followed up with an advance into Echizen, and on the 24th day of the fourth lunar month, surrounded Shibata's castle. Shibata, defeated, killed his wife and son, and then himself, a sad end to the life of Nobunaga's sister Oichi. Oda Nobutaka, in whose name Shibata had fought, was left trapped in Mino, his own brother Nobukatsu eventually laid siege to the fortress, and a despondent Nobutaka killed himself to avoid capture. The only survivors were, once again, Oichi's daughters by her previous marriage, who were spared by virtue of their lack of blood relationship to the Shibata. This would not be the last time Hideyoshi was challenged, though it was probably the most important. The very next year, he would be at war once again, this time with a face more familiar to us, 
Last week, we introduced Matsudaira Motoyasu, a young boy who had become a hostage to the Oda court and eventually fought for Imagawa Yoshimoto, jumping ship to the Oda after Imagawa's defeat. Matsudaira had stayed loyal to Nobunaga ever since, and had been rewarded handsomely with lands and titles and even an illustrious new name. In 1567, he'd been allowed to change his family name to the more regal-sounding Tokugawa, and his personal one to Ieyasu. Tokugawa Ieyasu was, by the time Nobunaga died, one of the most trusted Oda lieutenants, with lands sprawling across five different provinces, Mikawa, Totomi, Tsuruga, Kai, and Shinono. He had the backing of Nobunaga's other son, Nobukatsu, who decided he wanted to make a go himself at seizing control of the leadership from his nephew Hidenobu. Ieyasu was also a very able general. When he declared war in Nobukatsu's name in 1584, Hideyoshi's nephew Hidetsugu led an initial army against him at Nagakute in the third lunar month of the year and got beaten very badly. But here too, Hideyoshi would prevail, and I think you have to credit his other great talent for that, diplomacy. Hideyoshi spent much of 1584 ensuring that other powerful clans neighboring Oda territory, like the Uesugi, Hojo, and Mori, would not take advantage of the fighting to try and strike against the Oda and destroy them. After all these years of division after Nobunaga's death represented pretty much the last chance for any of these daimyo at preventing reunification at someone else's hands. Hideyoshi was well aware of that weakness, but he saw one additional aspect of the new political shape of things. As the decades had worn on, clear favorites had begun to emerge between the competing clans of Japan, with the Oda of course first among them, given the sprawling nature of their territories. But there were plenty of others too, yet while those families had grown quite powerful, that also meant they had more to lose. And so Hideyoshi began to offer these families a deal. If they worked with him rather than against him, he would be happy to confirm them in the lands they already had. And that's a pretty tempting deal, you have to admit. Sure, you could try and take Hideyoshi down and move into the top spot yourself, but I mean, really, if your family already has two or three provinces or even more, it's not like you're really hurting for power or wealth. Why risk it all instead of just securing what you already have? which meant that Daimyo, who might have been tempted to join Ieyasu's challenge, particularly after his initial victory at Nagakute, demurred instead. The neighboring Hojo clan, unrelated to the Hojo of old, by the way, literally had a marriage alliance with Ieyasu and still refused to help him against Hideyoshi when asked. And so Ieyasu was forced by the end of 1584 to agree to a ceasefire with Hideyoshi and give up any real attempt to challenge him, despite having beaten him on the battlefield. Hideyoshi's talents as a ruler were hard to deny by this point. His future biographers, like the author of the Ten Shoki, put it well. There were three talents associated with the first shogun Minamoto no Yoritomo's pacification of Japan. Yoshitsune, his brother, excelled in battle skill. Kajiwara Kagetoki, one of his advisors, concentrated upon worldly affairs. Hojo Tokimasa, his father-in-law, pursued the way of government. But now Hideyoshi, with a single heart, advanced his plans, laid in provision, and then fought his wars. Truly, he is a great leader, unknown in previous ages. Hideyoshi himself put it more simply in a letter written at the end of 1584. The new government of Japan will be superior to anything known since Yoritomo. From this point on, Hideyoshi's road to the top was pretty much a straight line. Oda Hidenobu was kept around, shuttled at first to his granddad's old fortress at Izuchi, and then to the guardianship of one of Hideyoshi's trusted followers. But he was increasingly marginalized, well, more marginalized, he was only four, and Hideyoshi accumulated more power and land to himself in the former Oda territories. By 1584, Hideyoshi more or less dispensed with the pretense of ruling on Hidenobu's behalf, and was instead directly handing out lands and titles to his vassals in his own name, rather than that of Hidenobu. Indeed, before long, Hideyoshi started granting lands in his name to Hidenobu, solidifying his hold on power by flipping the relationship that supposedly existed between them. 
Hidenobu, of course still a child, offered no objections, and would actually grow up to be a believer in and supporter of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Meanwhile, surrounding daimyo were given a choice, submit or be crushed. Most submitted, and those that did not, well, you can probably guess. For example, the Choso Kabe clan, who over the last few decades had conquered the entire island of Shikoku for themselves, tried to make a fight of things against Hideyoshi in 1585. They were resoundingly beaten, and only a timely decision to surrender spared them from being wiped out altogether, an act of mercy for which they were made to pay with three quarters of their lands. Given the obvious cost-benefit analysis of resisting Hideyoshi, his conquests were naturally pretty swift. He defeated Ieyasu and secured his hold over the Oda at the end of 1584. By 1590, the final holdouts against him were falling. Hideyoshi had done it. The civil wars were over. The country was reunified. All along the way, Hideyoshi worked to establish a political structure that would actually prove pretty durable going forward. You see, he was aware of the self-serving motives of many of the daimyo who had decided to side with him. Many of those who submitted to him did so not because they genuinely believed in him, but because of that risk-reward calculation we just talked about. And so Hideyoshi labeled these clans as Tozama, outside lords whose dubious loyalties barred them from any sort of trusted position in his new administration. By comparison, those who could be trusted, long-standing vassals like, say, the seven commanders who'd led the great victory at Shizugatake, over Shibata Katsue back in 1583, back when things were not looking so certain, were labeled as Fudai, the inner lords. These were the people who'd hitched their proverbial wagon to Hideyoshi back when doing so was still a gamble, and who as a result could be trusted as loyal and given positions of power and influence. This approach had two very important effects down the line. First, it allowed the old domains of the daimyo to survive. Anyone who was willing to conciliate themselves to Hideyoshi was allowed to endure, and Hideyoshi made it very clear he didn't look to rule the whole country personally. As a result, though the country was unified by 1590, it was unified in a decentralized way. Not as decentralized, admittedly, as it had been during, say, the years of the Ashkaga, Hideyoshi was careful to maintain a substantial power base all his own, which, alongside the lands of his Fudai trusted retainers, gave him a base from which to fend off any challenge. His military and economic position, simply put, was far better than that of Ashkaga Takauji or the other Ashkaga shoguns. To put it simply, under the Ashkaga, the power of the various provincial Shugo families was such that it was hard for the Ashkaga shoguns to restrain any one of them. Hideyoshi, by contrast, could restrain any daimyo who stood against him, though he couldn't take them all on, and that knowledge was an important part of why so many daimyo felt comfortable taking Hideyoshi's bargain and becoming Tozama. Hideyoshi's government, and I guess spoilers here for things that happened 400 years ago, wouldn't end up enduring under the Toyotomi, but that basic structure would, a testament to Hideyoshi's command of and understanding of the power politics of the time. Second, Hideyoshi abandoned many of Nobunaga's former policies, most notably the approach of holding his lieutenants and subordinates in terror. I think the easiest way to approach this is to consider Ieyasu's abortive campaign against Hideyoshi in 1584, which ended diplomatically. Now, take a moment and paint a mental picture for yourself. Based on what you know about Oda Nobunaga, what I've told you about Oda Nobunaga, How do you think he would have ended that particular little spat? Because, well, you never know with a hypothetical, I feel pretty safe saying burn it all to the ground as the most likely answer. Hideyoshi, by contrast, approached rule from a process of conciliation. Which is not to say he was not capable of using force. Shibata Katsue's death is a good example of that. But crushing his enemies on the field wasn't his first choice, not out of a sense of propriety or humanity, but just because that sort of thing is a gamble, and outside of a truly ridiculous power imbalance, you never know for sure you're going to win. The government that emerged over the course of the 1580s, and by the time of Hideyoshi's final victories in 1590, 
was thus a coalition of the willing and of the unwilling but not foolish. He ruled over a collection of daimyo who ranged from longtime loyalists to calculating followers to those who had been humbled by force into their new position, and for that last group, sure, they'd lost a few provinces along the way, or been transferred from their original territory to the other end of Japan, a favorite tactic of Hideyoshi, because it still offered the defeated something, but also forced them to start over in a place where they were dependent on Hideyoshi to stay in power. But even so, it's better than ending up dead, right? As for Hideyoshi himself, by the late 1580s he was riding high. He was the unquestioned master of the country, a feat marked by a growing list of honors attached to his name. In 1586, he received a new surname from the imperial court to mark his accomplishments, changing the family name from the peasanty-sounding Hashiba to the more regal Toyotomi, Abundant Minister. And he was definitely an abundant minister, because the court showered him in honors. Most importantly, in 1585, he was made both the Kanpaku, or regent to the emperor, and the Daijo Daijin, the prime minister of the old imperial civilian bureaucracy. Ostensibly, he retired from those jobs in 1591, but in time-honored tradition by this point, continued to exercise his authority behind the scenes with a new title, Taiko, the retired regent. This is how Hideyoshi is commonly referred to in history. One of the most famous chronicles of his reign is the Taikoki, or Chronicles of the Regent, and the most famous modern dramatization of his life is Yoshikawa Eiji's epic novel, Taiko. One title which Hideyoshi pointedly did not claim was that of Shogun. Hideyoshi did not try to set up a new Toyotomi Bakfu in name, though in practice the government he established fulfilled a similar role. The common explanation for this, advanced in later centuries by commentators during the Tokugawa shogunate, was that the title was an issue of pedigree. You had to be from the right sort of family, which is to say from a lineage that could trace itself back to the early imperial court and the imperial family. Minamoto no Yoritomo and Ashikaga Takauji actually could do that, thanks to their Seiwa Minamoto ancestry. Someone like Oda Nobunaga, or spoilers, Tokugawa Ieyasu, could plausibly fake it as members of the warrior class, bribing someone to draw up an appropriately illustrious genealogy, not that any Tokugawa-era scholars admitted Ieyasu's pedigree was likely fake, doing so would have drawn many angry government censors your way. But everybody knew where Hideyoshi had come from. Claiming he was secretly descended from thus and such emperor would have been a bit much. And for Tokugawa commentators, the whole thing was secret proof that the government that succeeded Hideyoshi was superior by virtue of good breeding. This is still the common reason given for why Hideyoshi never tried to claim the title of Shogun, but I would be remiss if I didn't note it's not universally accepted. In her biography of Hideyoshi, Mary Elizabeth Berry advances a very different theory, that Hideyoshi's view of the title of Shogun was such that he saw it as a demotion. After all, the shogunate he'd grown up knowing, that of the Muromachi Bakfu and the Ashikaga shoguns, was a weak, powerless regime. Who would willingly associate their new age of rule with that? And the previous Kamakura shogunate wasn't exactly an edifying example either. It had never succeeded in fully controlling the country and always split power with the civilian court in Kyoto. Thus, she argues, Hideyoshi saw the title of shogun as less than what he could otherwise achieve. It would be Tokugawa Ieyasu, instead, who saw the potential in re-energizing the old title and returning it to use in grander fashion. There are some potential issues, I think, with that theory. If Hideyoshi saw the shogunate as a demotion, why not feel the same about the, by this point, largely defanged imperial court? Here, Barry offers another suggestion, that Hideyoshi saw the court's function as complementary to his own and therefore useful. After all, he already had all the military legitimacy he needed from the best source there is. He won. But what he needed was legitimacy as a peacetime governor. And there he could tap into the long history of the court and its various titles. And indeed, that's exactly what Hideyoshi did. He made use of all the old titles, but also worked to lift up the imperial court in return. After all, its prestige now reflected on him. During the civil wars, the 
the court had become very impoverished, to the point that some emperors had been reduced to hawking calligraphy to make ends meet, and the Oku, the imperial harem, had been sharply reduced. After one emperor, Go Mikado, had died in 1500, his body had to be kept in a closet for a month while funds were scraped together to pay for an imperial funeral. Hideyoshi rebuilt Kyoto. He showered gifts and wealth on the court in exchange for their help burnishing his reputation. He very much did assert power over the court, calling the reigning emperor and his retired father to attend on him at his mansion in Kyoto, known as the Judakte, in 1588. And that's kind of a big deal, making the emperor come do a house call rather than going yourself. But when the imperial procession arrived, a clear sign of subordination to Hideyoshi, he responded by showering them in praise and acting very deferential. For example, the two men exchanged poems when they met. Here's the emperor's. Quote, Today is the day we achieve what we awaited in the branches of the pine I see the promise of our relations extending for the ages. Hideyoshi's, as my lord of myriad ages, has proceeded here in state, we may henceforth come close together, like the green pine standing tall beneath the eaves. And by the way, this was the start of a 100-round linked verse poem between all the attendees, and they're all pretty much on this theme. There's a lot of polishing each other's egos and self-congratulation. Anyway, by the 1590s, Hideyoshi's position was completely secure, or at least almost completely. He was still missing the one thing you do really need, an heir. He did have a wife who was very devoted to him despite the flirtations of Oda Nobunaga, known as Nenehime, and of course many concubines as well, but only ever had one son, Tsudematsu, who died in infancy in 1591. Hideyoshi, of course, already had made provisions for this. He had a nephew, Hidetsugu, who he'd adopted and begun to raise up as an heir. For example, after abdicating as imperial regent slash kampaku, he handed off the job to Hidetsugu, a pretty clear marker of where things were going. Or at least where they were going until 1593, when one of Hideyoshi's concubines, Yododono, gave birth to a son. But hey, we've all been here before where the planned succession that gets upset by the birth of a young son, I'm sure we've all learned from this experience, it's gonna go great this time. Next time, it and a separate decision to invade Korea for some reason don't go great, but that's for next time. That's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This show is a part of the Facing Backward podcast network. You can find out more about this show and our other shows at facingbackward.com, and you can support the network at patreon.com slash facingbackward. Special thanks to those who have given at our shout-out tier, Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Cat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, an anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sai, Gil, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, John, Christopher, Harrison Reese, Inoue Enrio's Ghostbusters, Nihongo Kaizen.com, Shimao Toshio's History of Japonesia Podcast, A House Is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Are, Road Scholars Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and Everything Changed When the Fire Nation Attacked. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time for the rise of Tokugawa Ieyasu.